beginning, we were enticing you, we were inviting you to be part of this because we promised that you will be better leaders when you leave. Uh, and I think it would be really remiss uh, to talk about leadership without actually defining what it means to be a leader. What do leaders actually do? Because it's one of those words that's really overused. Um, and as I said, somebody did some academic research and came up with as many as 25,000 articles. Um, and in some ways, the definition of leadership can be very simple or it can also be very complex. So I want to take a few minutes and she define what it means to be a leader and then talk a little bit about what it means to be a leader in the real world. And we'll invite uh, Tim and Susan to the stage as well. Um, as I told you during the webcast, um, a group of people is very much like a bunch of people on the elevator, something that happens as you travel to this meeting in the hotel. They say that a team is a bunch of people in an elevator, but the elevator is broken. Why? Before it broke, they were a group, but what made them a team? A common goal, exactly. They have a shared purpose, and that purpose is simply to get out of there. And the moment we become a team, uh, we need leaders. Why? Why is a team more effective when it has leaders? Well, what's going to happen if six or seven of us are in the elevator and the elevator breaks? The likely dynamics are going to be... There are decisions to be made, and it may be difficult to make them as a group or as a team. Um, someone has to take responsibility for the situation, which very often happens in business, and it's not clear who. Uh, there may be conflicting points of view that need to be reconciled and somebody needs to take charge. In other words, every time human beings organize themselves into a team because they have a common purpose, they need a leader. The notion of leadership has evolved over time. It used to be the guy with the biggest club in front of the troops uh, in Julius Caesar's time, and it has evolved quite a bit, and you can, to a degree, follow that evolution of the definition of leadership as you kind of look at different definitions over time. One of my favorite ones of all time, of course, comes from Peter Drucker, who's kind of like the modern father of management consulting, but uh, Drucker simply says that the leader is someone who has followers. As simple as that. Uh, as simple as that, but very effective, because one of the biggest shortcomings, one of the biggest fault, and sort of the, the, one of the biggest problems that leaders experience is that they're going like, charge! And they turn around and like, where did everybody go? Um, <laughs> And that's the problem with leadership, is if you have no followers, you're not a leader. And I'd like you to remember that. That if no one listens to you, or no one follows you, then you're failing as a leader. It doesn't matter how good your ideas are. It is the responsibility of a leader to have followers, to entice others to follow them. Um, obviously, you could hear some great thoughts from Warren Bennis and Bill Gates and so on. And Napoleon basically says, nothing is more difficult and therefore more precious than the ability to decide. I think George Bush called that the decider. Uh, the person who makes the decision, and, and also very importantly, takes responsibility for that decision. And that's something that's very difficult sometimes in business context because the decisions to make are very painful at times. We will exit the line of business and therefore lose the people that we're associated with. Uh, someone wants to develop a niche, but it's not part of our vision. We have to tell them that this is not something we can do. Uh, someone needs to retire. We need to tell them we don't have the money to buy their shares. Uh, some of these decisions can be very difficult, and the responsibility for those decisions can be crushing. So leadership is a privilege, uh, but leadership is also a burden. And it's a burden you will carry, because you will have responsibility not just for your own career, but you have a responsibility for all the decisions you make and all the people that you lead. That's why, generally speaking, when you kind of generically ask the question of who wants to be a leader, everyone wants to be a leader. But when there's a responsibility to be taken on, when there's a burden to be put in your backpack on that career journey, uh, very few people actually do raise their hand and do that. And that's why in that, I started that podcast, uh, or webcast, I should say, last time, with the notion that, uh, as the Volkswagen commercial said, in the, life, in the road of life, there are passengers and there are drivers, and drivers want it. Um, and unfortunately, a business can almost never have enough leaders. It's one problem that no one has, uh, and we've worked with many, many, many businesses over the years. I've never heard the CEO say, I, we have too many leaders, we don't know what to do with them. Now, these are good definitions of leadership, but let's actually take a look at a more detailed definition. Um, this one is a very academic one. So these two characters, Winston and Patterson, um, went through all the 25,000 articles on leadership and tried to digest and summarize the definition of leadership down to its component parts. So this one is really a mouthful, but I'm still going to read it, and then we're going to break it down. 
They basically say that a leader is someone who selects, equips, trains, and influences followers who have diverse gifts, abilities, and skills, and focuses them to the organization's mission and objectives, notion, notice the notion of vision, causing the followers to willingly, enthusiastically extend spiritual, emotional, and physical energy in a concentrated, coordinated effort to achieve the organizational vision and objectives. I've tried to memorize that one, and I'm uh, just not going to. But actually, let's break it down into four parts very quickly. Notice the responsibilities of the leader span from, first of all, developing others. And as G2, frequently the question is, well, you know, the car has one wheel. Um, uh, there's actually a car with two wheels, I'll tell you about that one. But um, a car has one wheel, and frequently G2 feels like, okay, the CEO and the founders have the wheel. I, I don't get to drive. They don't give me the keys at all, so how can I be a leader? And the answer is right here. Uh, you can probably develop others. You can serve as an example for others to follow. And it's a fundamental responsibility of a leader to be developing those around them, to, to select them, to recruit them, to equip them with the tools and the training that they need. It means also understanding your team, which really very often, and this is a shortcoming that I have, it means that whatever you do, that you take the time to look around. I know I spend my career looking forward, mostly looking at the clients, the clients that I'm working with, and all of you. Um, and a lot of my time and attention has been focused on your reactions and your needs and everything you do. But we kind of have to make it a habit to also look around because there are others. You're not sitting there alone in those client meetings. You're not there alone when you provide services to clients. So it's the fundamental responsibility of a leader to not only recruit their team, but also get to understand and develop that team. It's the responsibility of a leader to, to articulate a vision. Um, and whatever the vision of your firm is, you as a leader have to make sure that everyone on your team understands that vision, that everybody knows where you're going. Um, and we you know, remind them of that vision when necessary and guide them to have that vision when that's necessary as well. Motivating others is a very tricky but very significant part of leadership as well, making sure that everyone's excited and motivating the pursuit. And of course, coordinating is to a degree, an aspect of management there. So notice it's developing, understanding, articulating, um, it's motivating, and it's really organizing people. That's what leadership is. It's a complex task. It's very easy to kind of fall in the trap of saying, well, I'm not in control. Um, there's not that much I can do. The firm has an executive committee, has a CEO. I'm not the founder, I don't have the shares. I, I get outboarded all the time, what can I do? But at minimum, what you can always do is serve as an example. Uh, people tend to follow the example of their leaders. You know how they say that pets eventually start acting like their owners? Generally speaking, an organization is always acting like its leaders. And you will find that whatever the habits of the leaders are, whatever the tendencies of the leaders are, whatever their propensity is, the organization will sooner or later mimic that. If you find people, I was talking to a business yesterday and they were talking about the fact they just went through a merger and it was saying, well, this merger is turning into a takeover, our entire team is very demotivated, they're not liking the situation, uh, they feel like they're not being respected, and I don't know what to do about it. And I was kind of scratching my head thinking like, well, chances are, if they're feeling that way, that's because you feel that way. They can sense that they follow that example. Chances are. If you feel that you're being taken over, if you feel that like you're not given enough credibility, you're not given enough prominence in the new organization, that's probably why they feel that way as well. I think in Texas here they call that the bell cow. You know, the cow that walks in front of the herd with a bell, and the rest of the herd follows them. Um, whether you know it or not, you're a bell cow. If you're here, that means that there's some that walk behind you, and you wear that belt, and you have to accept responsibility for that. Leadership, on the other hand, is not a position, it's not something that's going to show up on your business card. Your business card will never say, you know, fill up leader of people. Um, I think that's somewhere in the, actually, the Omer, like the Iliad, Agamemnon, the leader of people. Anyways, be that in mind. Um, leadership is not a position, it's a responsibility that emerges. It's a, it's a baton that you carry willingly. There is some interaction between, however, between leadership and management, and management and ownership. Uh, I've learned all of this from Tim Koch, so I'll actually ask Tim to describe that in the moment when he shows up on stage. But notice that there's always going to be some overlap in the middle between these terms, uh, but they don't per per perfectly align. Uh, they're going to be different. Very importantly, good leaders are good followers. Uh, General George Patton actually says that, lead me, follow me, or get out of the way, which I really, really like that. In other words, show me the way, or listen to me, but the worst thing in a situation is people who don't want to give up control, 
but at the same time are unwilling to leave. And unfortunately, this is that's very, very common occurrence. People who are kind of stuck wanting to control the situation, but very unwilling to actually either follow or suggest where the car should be going. And that's very dangerous for a business because you can get stagnated at that level for many, many, many years. And that can really drain the energy and the motivation out of everyone. Being a good leader is also knowing when to follow, knowing when you need to support, to contribute, and to follow the ideas of others, or simply get out of the way and just recognize that this is not your time, this is not your time to lead. Now, we talked about personalities yesterday quite a bit, and inevitably we kind of have to touch on the interaction between personality and leadership. What type of personality makes you a good leader? What do you think is the answer? What's the personality that makes you a good leader? All of those things. So these are, <laughs> yeah, you can grab all of them. Uh, these are known as the big five. And the big five uh, in these days in personality, so academic research on personality tends to focus on these five um, clusters or characteristics. Uh, essentially what they do is they grab as many as 800 adjectives that can be used to describe a human being and their personality. And then they did research on how those things cluster. And they basically find that all 800 tend to focus on these five dimensions. Uh, extroversion versus introversion is a very familiar one. Conscientiousness is kind of the, the tendency to get things done, the tendency to persevere with the task. You remember the marshmallow test that they give, gave to the kids, the kids that had to delay gratification, probably you're familiar with that. Um, this is conscientiousness, the ability not to eat the marshmallow. You know about marshmallow tests, right? Yeah, everybody knows. Agreeableness is the tendency to seek harmony, the tendency to argue, that's lower agreeableness, or higher agreeableness, the tendency to agree and value harmony in a conversation or in an interaction with a group of people. Emotional stability simply means how much you worry. What's your level of anxiety? Some people worry a lot, some people don't worry much. And then the final one is the openness to new experiences. To what degree you are adventure seeking, novelty seeking, versus to what degree you like routine. So with those definitions in mind, which qualities do you think leaders have? Conscientiousness tends to be there. Generally speaking, effective leaders tend to be conscientious, fairly conscientious. So, and I think it's to be an effective leader because I'm looking at every one of these going, okay, you know, so my leader may not have self discipline, right? And and um, some leaders control and regulate, I mean, they can't control their impulses. So, we're looking at what makes an effective leader, right? Fantastic point, right? Fantastic point. And research uh, to a, the research kind of differentiated between leader emergence, in other words, the rise of someone to a leadership position, versus leadership effectiveness. Emergence tends to be closely correlated to extroversion, conscientiousness. Effectiveness, on the other hand, is not necessarily correlated the same way to all. So extroversion, conscientiousness, clearly a part of emergence. People who are highly neurotic uh, were not <coughs> signaled out as very good leaders. That one is painful because I show up pretty high on neuroticism. I worry a lot. I stay awake at night thinking about stuff. Agreeableness, this is an interesting one, was not uh, correlated with emergence, but was correlated with effectiveness. Does it make sense? People who are agreeable don't always have the fastest and the, the best careers, but when they emerge in a position of prominence and leadership, they may be the best leaders to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of some of the conundrum is that the ambitious, ego-driven types that will elbow their way to the top may make it to the top a little faster than others, but they're not particularly effective at the top. But I remember very distinctly, most times have 250 partners, all of whom were expected to be leaders. They surveyed all of us in terms of personality types. They essentially found that we are a very diverse group of people that fall in all of these categories. Sort of the legend that successful partners are the eight types that are extroverted business developer types. You saw that yesterday. There are people in every corner of the room, depending on how we slice it. So generally speaking, whatever your personality is, uh, you probably have a good chance to be a leader. Of course, some personality types may make that job a little easier. Some of this also has to do with style. So I want to differentiate between leadership responsibility and leadership style. 
Um, again, academic research listed as many as 25 characteristics that have to, to describe a leader. Anywhere from autocratic, to instrumental, to coercive, to expressive, visionary, opinion-driven, and so on. Essentially grouping them in five categories of leadership. They're saying that the styles of leadership can be described as autocratic. That's the sort of a Columbus, egg on the table, Joseph Stalin types. The participative leadership, that the people who invite others to participate, the people who invite others to, to come together and facilitate that process to come together, to the visionary leaders, those that have a strong sense of where they want to lead, the, the, the Moses of the world that will part the sea with the strength of their vision, the humane leaders, the Gandhis of the world, those that have such powerful sense of conviction that they draw others to them, and the laissez-faire, which is um, essentially the way I parent my kids, which is like, yeah, do whatever you want. Okay? I'm glad you're coming home, so that's cool. Uh, so for some reason, I'm very easy going with my kids. But uh, that's essentially letting the place kind of run itself like a daycare center and so just making sure that kids don't get hurt. But those are styles. They're not necessarily the most, uh, the best way of being a leader. That's just a way of grouping the styles. Although you can probably kind of think about it, and there's some interesting discussion to be had there. In terms of the phases of history of a firm and the style of leadership that works during that phase of history. Does that make sense? It's kind of interesting quote that I kind of came across some time ago. Um, I think this was John Quincy Adams or John Adams, and I always mix up the two. Whoever wrote letters to Abigail, I think that was John Adams, his wife. Um, and he says, we will be soldiers so that our sons can be farmers, so their, their sons can be poets. Notice the transition of sort of personalities and visions and so on. And in some ways, the farm may evolve like that. that the early days are days of survival. The early days are days of trying to build something that's very difficult. Then the later days are the days of structuring and bringing process and bringing structure to um, you know, if this is the time of entrepreneurs, this is the time of MBAs. The people who, who perfect management, who perfect process, who, who carefully manage. And whoever the poets are in the business setting, I think that, that, that is some, something else to happen. But in some ways, if you look at this and say, well, our founders may be the, may be the soldiers, but we are the farmers, and that's what we're good at, and that's, that's what we bring. And the leadership that is effective in these circumstances may transition. And therefore, the types of people that we need may be different. Yet here we need those that are a little more adventurous and risk-taking. Here we may need those that are a little more participative, that are able to bring others together to facilitate, to organize a little better. And then final talk on this, um, leadership is not about extroversion and introversion at all. Actually, there was some research done uh, in Pizza Hut franchises, which is where real management happens. They found something very interesting that a well-functioning enterprise, a well-functioning location, that had a good team, actually did very, very well with an introverted leader. In other words, a team that functions well does not need someone slamming their fist on the table at all. On the contrary, someone who's a little more participative in their management style may be more effective. On the other hand, a dysfunctional place, a place that was underperforming the standards of Pizza Hut franchises, which are very demanding, uh, I'm not making fun of Pizza Hut, by the way, I just I don't know why I'm doing that. But anyways, um, they, they found that teams that struggle may need a little more authoritative leader. They may need someone who, who drives a little harder in terms of pursuing the goal. Make sense? So kind of leaders play a complex but a very important role. Um, and I actually want to pursue a discussion of how leaders emerge in the real world, what it actually means, and how, how do, what's the history of enterprises and research for the leaders? So, Tim and Susan, if you don't mind joining me on the stage, uh, please grab a seat and let's talk about this. Tell us about your career and tell us about your farm. Maybe Susan started with you and Private Ocean. How did Private Ocean emerge? How did you join Private Ocean? What's happening there? Okay, so I um, am not from the industry. Um, I have had many years of uh, business management experience in a multitude of industries. Um, started off with what's now Lockheed Martin. I moved into the wine industry. I was in nonprofit education. I got my <coughs> MBA and I didn't know where I was going to go. So um, at that point in time, just by a fluke of the universe, I fell into wealth management. And so I joined what was then Salient Financial um, in 2005. And it was, a, it was a small firm. I think we were maybe $100 million in assets <coughs> under management. 
And over the course of the next several years, um, we grew the business. And I was brought in at that time because the founder of that firm wanted to become an ensemble, wanted to grow the business, wanted to uh, really put in, you know, change it from a practice to a business. And um, so from there, we, we did a lot of work on institutionalizing the business, putting in policies and procedures, uh, making sure that we had the right people in the seats, beginning to do some external marketing and those kinds of things. Uh, in 2008-09, um, we merged with Friedman and Associates, and the following year became Private Ocean um, in name. So from that point forward, we've grown to where we are now. Uh, we had two acquisitions in 2018, mm -hmm. and we've grown to about $2.2 billion in assets under management. Uh, since the merger in 2009, where I believe combined we were about 800. So, really, that brings me to where I am today, and um, yeah, that's my story. So, Susan, that's from 100,000, 100 million to 2.2 billion. How, how quickly was that? Uh, over about, it, it took a while. I mean, remember, this was primarily organic growth up until just 2018. So on our own, organically, as private ocean, we hit about 1.2 billion. And then we acquired to bring in the next, uh, you know, effectively, billion dollars. So um, it took, say, from 2009 to 2018. Now from the 100 million, it was about 15 years. So it, you know, it took some time <laughs> growing organically, but uh, yeah. 15 years is not an end of the scheme of things. Right. Fantastic. Tim, your story? Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, it's a long one because it's been almost 47 years now since I began in this profession, and it has two dimensions. One dimension is sort of the industry dimension. I've been involved in a lot of the developments in our industry over that period of time, beginning as early as probably 1980, where I was one of the founders of a certificate education program at the University of California, where I taught for 18 years, and I still now do occasionally teach, just taught a course this last fall. And um, I was involved, uh, because of that education involvement, I got involved with the CFP board quite a long time ago, and chaired the uh, sub-board that created the CFP examination. So all of those of you who uh, have struggled with the CFP examination, you can blame me uh, for that. Um, I eventually uh, chaired the CFP board and went on to chair the International uh, Credentialing Authority, the Financial Planning Standards Board. I chaired the uh, Foundation for Financial Planning and uh, today, I do a lot of work in, under the name Coaches Global in consulting, uh, some overseas, most domestically on strategy work uh, for RIA firms, particularly on the topics of succession, uh, ownership, uh, ownership transitions, management transitions. And I do a lot of executive coaching, too. I coach a lot of RIA CEOs and other senior people. So that's the professional dimension. On the, um, if you will, client service, RIA dimension, uh, I stepped away from being the CEO of uh, Experient uh, a little bit over 10 years ago. I stepped away from being the chair of its board about uh, eight and a half years ago. And so I haven't been an employee of Experient for quite a long time, but I continue because of a very long-scaled uh, uh, equity transition. I continue to be a, an owner, small owner, one of 65 owners of Asperia. Uh, before Asperia came into being um, as a result of a merger in 2008 between a firm that I founded, Coaches Fitz, in San Francisco, and a firm in Los Angeles called Quintile. When we put those two firms together, each was about two and a half billion of AUM. Uh, and when we combined them, we were probably, if not the, one of the two or three largest RIA firms in the country at that time. And in the meantime, 
We ch by the way, we changed the name, and there's an interesting sub-story about that name change, but we changed the name of the firm to a new name. We made it up, Experient, and Experient now uh, has 10 offices and about 180 employees and 65 owners and manages, it changes, day-to-day uh, -day with these numbers, but it's about 13 or $14 billion. Uh, at this point, but going back to the beginnings in 1973, before there was a spirit, there was Coaches Fitz, before that there was Deloitte, I ran the Deloitte financial planning business for about five years, and before that there was Bank of America, I ran Bank of America's financial planning business for about five years, and before that I was very junior and wasn't running anything. So that's a real quick story. Fantastic. We, we started our discussion with the notion of vision and the importance of vision. And I guess I can't help but ask the question, what's today, what's the vision for us, period? Well, um, it's a really great question. I think I may not be the best person to articulate an answer to that, uh, but to the extent that I can. Uh, I'm still obviously very much in communication with the firm and uh, have many friends there. But you should have Rob Francis, uh, the CEO of uh, Spirit, come and talk about that. But I'll give you what I think his answer would be. The vision of that firm is to be, we claim to be the leading independent wealth management firm. And so the vision for Spirit is to be forever the leading independent wealth management by the way, notice example of vision, a very effective one. Years ago, I heard that vision articulated as to be the Deloitte of the wealth management industry, maybe because many of the partners came from Deloitte, right? There's a lot of Deloitte DNA yeah. in Esprit. I, I was a Deloitte partner, Linda Fitz was a Deloitte senior manager, um, Mike Fitzhugh was a Deloitte senior manager, Tom Tracy worked at Deloitte. Uh, Rod Francis was a Deloitte partner, so there's a lot of Deloitte uh, DNA. Yeah, and a great way of articulating a vision because the accounting industry clearly recognizes its four leading firms as sort of the best place to practice, develop a career, and so on, and many of those characteristics transfer over. Uh, Susan, so what's the vision for Private Ocean and the ever evolving? Yeah, so. The vision was originally, and I know this is overused a lot, but I'm going to say it anyway, to be the premier wealth management firm in the Bay Area. That was originally our vision. As we expanded our footprint and now have an office in Seattle that has moved to being, we're not as global as these guys, uh, to being the premier wealth management firm on the West Coast, right? So. Um, when we define Premier, we've gone through a lot of exercises defining what Premier means to us. And really this is more of an internal vision. This is not necessarily something that we espouse out there. It's something that we believe in here. So our vision's a little bit different in that regard. Our external uh, statement is that we are, you know, personal and powerful and that you know, that's our external comment or commentary to the clients and prospects. Fantastic. And Susan, today you are the chief operating officer of the firm, right? Right. What does the chief operating officer do in the private ocean? What are the responsibilities? Who are the people you lead? So this uh, position has evolved over time. Clearly <clears throat> in the beginning, in the early years, um, it was wearing all kinds of hats. So it was marketing, it was HR, it was strategy, it was finance and admin, it was um, you know, overseeing some of the client service operations. It was a whole lot of things. As we've grown and as time has gone on, I've uh, let go of a lot of those different roles. We now have other people. So now my role is more overseeing what's going on with the other departments. We um, created an expanded leadership team several years ago of next-gen people. And as time has gone on, we now have a director of client services, a director of marketing, a director <coughs> of investment operations, and um, a director of wealth management. So my role has evolved more into sitting with them, empowering them, 
helping to develop them as leaders. Fantastic. And Tim, you were CEO for many, many years. Um, what does the CEO do? Oh, well, that's uh, basically whatever needs to be done. Uh, it's, the, it's, the residual, it's the residual authority, uh, one way to put it, to make it comprehensive. Uh, Harry Truman said the buck stops here. So that's certainly one of the definitions of the role of the CEO is to make ultimate decisions where decisions need to be made. There's no other authority appropriate to do that. Um, but the role of a CEO is, is as you described already, has a lot to do with articulating the vision of the firm, being the cultural champion uh, for the firm. All firms have, or should, have a fairly well understood sense of what their values are and what the culture of the firm is, and the CEO should be the most significant exemplar of that uh, culture. Uh, the CEO has responsibility for uh, managing a subsidiary office. When a firm gets large enough that you can have the luxury of having uh, talented, experienced people managing particular functions, like the advisory function or the investment function or operations or HR, all of those officers, in a sense, report to the CEO and it's the CEO's job to select, manage, uh, incent, uh, guide all of those people. So ultimately, the CEO is not it doesn't have a finger in every minute pie, but has responsibility for all the pies. Fantastic. Asperia has a compelling vision and an ambitious vision as well. <coughs> How did that emerge? Kind of what was the process? that you use to arrive at that destination, that sense of destination? I don't think, uh, it's, a, it's a great question, and I wish I had an answer that sounded like it make a great uh, case study yeah. for a business school uh, case, but I think it simply emerged. We sort of looked around and said, hmm, what are we? And we, um, I forget who uttered the word, maybe it was me, uh, but, at, at some uh, strategy meeting about the time that we were beginning the initial integrations of the two firms that merged, uh, we sort of tried, tried to describe ourselves and leadership, leading, uh, kept coming up. And so we said, well, that is a description of us. We're leading, we're doing things that other firms have not yet done. This was back in 2008. There hadn't been a merger like ours before that. Uh, and so we articulated that we are the leading firm, but of what kind? And how do you clarify that enough that people won't challenge you? Yeah, right, you're the leader. Well, all right, we are the leading independent wealth management firm. And by independent, we meant a firm that's owned entirely by its own people, has no intentions of becoming part of uh, a larger, let's say, public entity, and that is the strategy that many firms actually actively pursue. And so we, and then the other element of it was the durability, the permanence. We expect to be this way for it. Tell us about that notion of a permanent firm, because it's a very powerful and very interesting notion. What does it mean to be permanent? Well, it means that you've set up the infrastructure such that you don't have to, um, first of all, that you never go out of business, that you have a very robust service offering that's going to continue to be attractive to clients indefinitely into the future, and that you're sufficiently uh, agile enough to change with the circumstances, and if the right way to do delivery in the future is all digital, fine, we can do that too. Um, so, not that we expect that, that would be the case, but if that were to become the case, well, why, if someone can do it, why not we do that? So, so it's, uh, we don't expect ever to go out of business, and we expect to be durably of the ownership characteristic that we have now that we're owned entirely by people within the firm. And we, that requires two, uh, it requires a reliable pricing 
that you that you've got a pricing mechanism that people will agree. Yeah, that's given the uncertainties around the value of a private firm. That's more or less the case, mm -hmm. and so that when shares come on the market, the market will <coughs> clear. Buyers will say, yeah, that's a fair price. Sellers will say, yeah, that's a fair price. So you have to have a reliable pricing mechanism, and that you have to have a sufficiently robust, and by that I mean large enough, group of owners that this can be expected to continue indefinitely. Yeah, can do it with two or three owners. You need a lot. Notice that interaction between the vision uh, and then the consequences of that decision to be permanent implies certain models of ownership, certain models of transitioning ownership from one position to another. Mm -hmm. and, and to a degree, Tim, you, you led the way personally in many ways in the industry, uh, including the way in which you transitioned your leadership role. You, you were CEO for many years, and then you were not. Um, can you sort of tell us a little bit about how you transitioned the sure. CEO of John to Rob Francis and sure. present day CEO? Sure. Well, I'll begin. I'll begin with one element that is the. I do a lot of consulting on this very topic. And a great book on the topic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but so I'll say right up front that there is an emotional element to this that is inescapable. No one transitions from being the boss to not being the boss without some kind of emotional trauma. And you either deal with it well or not, and it takes some time to deal with it. Uh, so I'll, I'll certainly admit that that was the case for me as well. When I stepped away from being CEO of Experient in November 2009, uh, so a little bit over 10 years ago now, I had been the CEO of something for about 25 years. So the move from being the boss of something to not being the boss of anything was a huge psychic transition. One of the things that made that easier was that I took a sabbatical from the immediate the next day after I stepped away from being CEO. I became sort of incognito. My, my email account was shut down, my idea. My voicemail account was shut down, my idea. And I had no plans to be in communication with anyone in the firm until I came back six months later. The mistake was six months wasn't long enough. It should have been a year. I think a year would have been the right duration of that. So that, that, was, that helped with the emotional transition. So going back, stepping away from the emotional aspects of it, for me, the desire was to be personally a leader. I, attended, you know, attend all the conferences, and even back in the early 2000s, there were issues around the need for succession planning within the RIA space, and people would, speakers would come and speak about the need for this, and I attended, and on my way back from one of these, I just committed to myself, I am not going to be that guy who needs to be blasted out of the role of CEO. I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to take charge of it. I'm going to, train, I'm going to, I, I'm going to create the architecture of my own transition. So I did, and I went back the very next day and spoke to my senior colleagues and said that uh, I'm going to step away from being CEO in five years. We have five years to figure out the details of how to do that. And um, my colleagues said, that sounds about right. I think they were, uh, they weren't looking to get rid of me. Um, but I think they felt comfortable that they had five years along with me to figure that out. So we formed a search committee uh, made up of a couple of people within the firm and uh, a couple of people outside the firm. Uh, two of whom were clients, uh, both themselves CEOs, of very you know, Fortune 100 uh, uh, firms. Uh, and they, we were in the process of, of identifying the characteristics, defining what the job description was, and starting to look around for possible persons to, to take the job, whether internally or from outside the firm. And, Four years into, well actually no, three years into that five-year process, um, 
I had conversations with principals at Quintel. I knew, I had known one of them very well because we worked together at Bank of America many years earlier. I met Rod Francis and I came away from that meeting pretty convinced that uh, if Rod Francis were not, were available, I would want to hire him away from Quintal to be my successor at Coach Spence. So the, the, the issue developed into a merger between the two firms, with Rob being targeted to be the CEO after I did a two-year stint as CEO, as the initial CEO. And uh, that was part of the merger negotiations. I would be CEO for two years and step down, and Rob would then become the CEO. Fantastic. Um, both of you mentioned the word partners, and that's an important word in many of the firms in the room, um, almost all of them. Um, who are the partners of Private Ocean? What does it mean to be a partner in Private Ocean? Are partners expected to be leaders? Uh, a lot of questions bundled together. Right. Well, I think it's we have 21 owners, mm -hmm. and we have 51 employees. So we have a lot of partners in considering our size. Almost half and half. Almost half and half. Uh, many of them are advisors, but not all. Um, <clears throat> other operational, you know, areas do have. We have partners in client. Our director of client service, our director of investment ops. So there are other partners beyond revenue generating partners. So I think that's important to know. Um, the idea of a partner in our firm is to show up as a leader. And you know, we were talking about leadership and. In, in my experience, leaders show up everywhere. It's not just up here, it's throughout you know, the firm. People emerge as leaders because of their personality, because of who they are. So the expectation is that we encourage our partners to really show up as leaders and to remember that that doesn't make them this. What that makes them is someone who leads by example, who shows others how it should be and and how to, you know, to walk the talk and, and be those people. For whatever reason, there's always a, a perception, perhaps, by others in the firm that suddenly this person has a great deal of power and management um, that they're going to now manage. That's not true at all. In fact, we work very hard to help our partners understand that management and ownership, leadership, two very different things in our firm. So I guess, does that answer your question? Yeah, to a to, to significant degree. And uh, Tim, I, I really, I, I've always enjoyed listening to you describe that. Uh, what's the interaction, and Susan brought that up, what's the interaction between ownership and management, management and leadership? So some owners are managers, but not all owners are managing, and some leaders are managers, but not all leaders are managers. God, how do these circles come together? Uh, it's, it is a complex um, uh, complex combination where those, those Venn diagrams do come together. But the important thing is to recognize that they do not have to. And this is a mistake that I think a lot of people in the RIA space make. Uh, is that they assume that ownership necessitates management control and requires uh, characteristics of leadership. And those things are often required. Uh, someone who is going to be the COO, let's say, uh, of a firm probably should be one of its owners and needs to be a leader but there are, among, for example, the 65 owners of Asperia, there are many people there who have no management responsibilities at all, other than to manage their own individual functions or their own client relationships, but don't have responsibility necessarily for managing any um, overarching function or have no people that report to them. Uh, they are simply uh, thought to be appropriate uh, exemplars of the culture and uh, are uh, people who are willing to make a permanent commitment for their career to the firm. And so th those are the most important criteria uh, that I would suggest for people to become owners, is that they're very good at what they do. Uh, you don't want uh, an owner 
to be some stumble bum who doesn't know what they're doing. So they have to be competent in their job, whatever that job is. Uh, they have to be very good exemplars of the culture of the firm. Uh, they don't have, uh, it's an aside here that sometimes it's helpful to have people who have very different personalities than other people in the firm. This does not mean that everyone is a clone of everyone else. Uh, and that they have to be willing to make a permanent commitment of their professional career to the firm. I don't think there should be an expectation of, well, I'll be a partner for about five years and then I'll go off and do something else. The expectation going in that I'm here for the duration of my entire professional career. But uh, so that, that's about the, if you will, the ownership. The ownership is ultimately about money. It's about buying in, it's about receiving uh, distributions of profits, it's about eventually selling your ownership interest to someone in the future who will buy that ownership interest. So I think the simplest way to think about ownership is it's money, it's financial. Whereas management is about responsibility and accountability. It's about achieving the business goals of the organization. And so someone who is a manager has to be, has to be very good at what they do, has to have the aptitude and skills to uh, manage the resources they have, including in RIA firms, primarily the people resources uh, that they have, but they don't have to have a financial commitment. They simply have to be good at their job. And maybe eventually the firm decides to offer them a financial opportunity, but that wouldn't have to be a, a prerequisite to their having a management responsibility. And very important, here's the real test. Someone should be able to be fired from their management role if they're not doing the job, they're not doing the job well enough. It's really difficult to fire an owner they're, unless somehow they commit fraud or something like that. There's usually some provision for being able to oust an owner. But generally speaking, people don't get fired from their ownership status. It's a financial status. I paid my money, I own this piece of the business, so you can't fire me from that. No, but we can fire you from your job if you're not doing your job. And so that's the real test. Management and ownership are distinct in that managers should be able to be fired and sometimes need to be fired if they're not, if they're not doing their job. And then leadership is situational. Uh, clearly the um, senior people within the firm who have responsibility for management need to be leaders of some kind, either autocrats or participatory, depending upon what the circumstances are. But they need, those people do need to be leaders. But does every owner need to be a leader? I don't think so. It's great if they are situational. Um, if, if any of you have ever been to an Outward Bound uh, event, Outward Bound is about two things. It's about um, uh, understanding that you need to trust your co-workers. Uh, there's all kinds of exercises that they do with Outward Bound things that causes you to demonstrate you, that you have trust. And it's also about emergent leadership. And the emergent leadership, and the point of it is, it can come from anywhere. The least, the, the lowest compensated, most junior person within an organization can figure out how to overcome this obstacle, whereas the other people may be stymied by it. So the leadership is situational often. It, it, it responds to what the challenge happens to be. Yeah, can't help but tell a story about that. I was um, joining uh, the CEO of a client visiting a firm they had just acquired. Um, and it was a firm with about 25 people on staff and all 25 were gathered in a conference room. And it was the first time the, the newly acquired team was actually meeting sort of the CEO of the acquiring firm and so on. So, so the CEO did a little presentation and then the team, the 25 of them, sort of had a chance to do some Q&A and to interact with the CEO as a way of beginning the integration process. Uh, you can tell everybody was shell shocked. I mean, the people were sitting there and faces were long, and it was not a pleasant atmosphere. There was a lot of anxiety in the room. You can tell everyone's worried about what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my future, which is not the environment you want in an acquisition, but it, that was the environment they had. 
And then there were clearly two people that were trying to address the situation, and gradually they were having success with that. They were asking questions and good questions. They were trying to point the characteristics of the new structure that exists, the new organization. So, so sort of through questions, through encouragement of others, gradually they're changing the atmosphere in the room. So in the span of a couple of hours, it goes from kind of doom and gloom, long faces, to people starting to smile and starting to have some confidence that this may actually work out for me. This may be a good career move for me. So, so these two really changed the atmosphere in the firm. And I don't know any of these people. I mean, the acquisition was not announced prior to that, I had no idea, so it was kind of a surprise thing. So walking back to the car with the CEO, I tell him, it's like, say, uh, just, gosh, I mean, this, this firm clearly has a couple of really good leaders. This must be two of the more prominent partners. And my client turns to me and says, well, you know what, one of them is the CEO, uh, the other one's the receptionist. Uh, and literally, that was sort of the, the, the leadership is not a, it's not a job title, and in situations that matter, uh, when we get stuck in the elevator, it may come from anywhere, um, and it's not the business card you carry, it's kind of your attitude, your approach to others, your, your propensity to, to desire to find others, find the outcome, and just one of many examples like that. Uh, I'm going to explore something else. Yeah, yeah, one, one more thing. One of the things that, that you mentioned, I think, was that you know a partner, I, I think, at least at Private Ocean, in our mind, a partner may not be a formal leader, but they are expected to um, have those qualities, at least to be able to um, carry the torch for Private Ocean, to show others the way it should be done. So there is an expectation for our partners to have some leadership qualities um, throughout our firm anyway. So that may not be the case everywhere, but. Yeah. You know, I, I, excuse me, Susan, I certainly agree. And that, in a sense, that's an implication <laughs> that set about being uh, a good exemplar of the culture. Exactly, yeah. Uh, partners, um, many of them eventually, 20-something, 60-something in your case, um, you know, they are owners of the farm. How do partners come together, make decisions together, exercise their um, sort of privilege of directing the, the, the future of the farm, and inevitably leaning towards what's the role of a board of directors or board of members? How do they come together? How they're organized? What role do they play in governance of the farm? Well, so we are an LLC, and we don't have a formal board of directors, but our owners essentially function that way. We meet with our owners group twice a year, um, and then we have an executive committee that consists of the CEO, myself, one outside person, and um, one other owner. So the executive committee does a lot of the decisions around approving the budget, um, you know, doing the day-to-day -day type things. Our CEO is the managing partner, so he ultimately you know, manages the firm. But the owners do come together on an annual basis once to decide what the next year will look like, and then again mid-year to see how we're doing. And the, the idea there is that we bring forth the larger strategies of the firm. What, what are we going to do? What is the plan to grow to three billion to five billion? Um, what should we be thinking about? What are we missing? What should we be doing? So they, they have, effectively function as our board of directors. Um, at the end of the day, the owners only vote on certain things though, and that is admission of new owners. Uh, if we are going to change the business model and become something other than an RAA, if we were to decide to sell the business, if we acquire another business. So these are pretty big items that ownership votes on. The rest of it is really handled by the executive committee and the uh, CEO. So. Yeah, I, I would, thank you, Susan. I would add just a couple of thoughts to that. One is that there's a continuum of, uh, of sophistication around these features. And even for very small firms, you can begin <laughs> with the notion of a design that involves layers of management management and <coughs> governance, I'm going to introduce a new term here, governance, governance responsibility where the owners get to decide certain things and then they delegate everything else to the next tier of uh, responsibility for governing or managing 
that then delegates to the next tier. And um, in a small firm with only 10 or so people and maybe one or two owners, that design sort of, um, as a matter of necessity, sort of constricts down to those one or two owners. And they either agree or they don't agree, or the one owner is the boss of everything. But as you, as the firm gets larger, and certainly by the time you're out sort of over here, excuse me, where you have maybe hundreds of employees and scores of owners, then you must implement uh, something that is uh, has a lot of reality to these structures. So the owners, the shareholders, and the partners, whatever you may call them, get to decide certain things. And admission of new owners is typically one of those, but that's not always the case. Sometimes that even that's delegated. And in very large firms, it would be. The big accounting firms don't have all the partners vote on all the new partners. That is delegated to some kind of managing structure. So at some point, you even lose, the, the owners lose that ability or that responsibility. But in most RIAs, certainly the ones I'm aware of, the, the owners do get to decide about who gets to become an owner. Uh, then election of the next tier of the governance structure, whatever it's called, board of directors, executive committee, they have lots of managing committee, lots of different names for this. But the owners of the firm are usually empowered to elect who appears at that level of responsibility for governance and management. And then in the, so I'm, I'm using Spirit as an example here. The Spirit owners meet uh, by teleconference once a quarter. Uh, there are 10 offices from one coast to the other, so a physical meeting would very frequently be very cumbersome and expensive. And they typically meet once a year physically uh, in one place uh, for the kinds of conversation that, that Susan described, really big picture, uh, a, a review of the financials, uh, a sense of where our expectations are, are there any acquisitions on the horizon, that type of thing. And then the owners uh, elect the board of directors. The owners uh, today uh, vote, but it's pretty perfunctory uh, on new owners because it's always been vetted through the executive committee and the board of directors. And so by the time it gets to the shareholders, you'd have to really have discovered something that no one else has discovered about why this person should not be an owner. And then the owners vote for changes in the operating agreement. That's really important. If the operating agreement is going to be changed, and the spirit requires a 65% vote of the ownership weight. So some people's votes are much more valuable than others, but everyone gets to vote on changes to the operating agreement. Awesome. Susan, you had a question, and of course that's an invitation for all of you to participate. Yeah, and we formed an executive committee a number of years ago. Um, I think it was recommended by Philip, actually. Someone pressured you into it. Right, someone pressured us into it. And it was a good idea. I mean, I'll stand up. Put a lot of structure into the organization where there really hadn't been any before. Um, departments that hadn't existed and, and an executive committee um, formalizing the CEO role and, and all of that. And then we tried to actually implement it, and I think the idea was great. The execution, I felt like we just were not clear on what it is we were trying to accomplish with an executive committee. So we had owners, we had partners, not all the partners were owners, then we had the executive committee, then we had the CEO, and all these different levels when we were figuring it out. We had the vision that the executive committee was implementing whatever we decided as a partnership group. And then it's recently been communicated to us that it's actually flipped. The executive committee should be leading the strategy for the organization as a whole and then giving those almost marching orders to the CEO to choose who's going to be implementing it at the organization. So I feel like as a firm, we're still trying to figure that out. 
and if you can provide any insight on how those different groups work. Right now, all of our partners are in fact owners, but someday, potentially, we may once again have partners who are not owners, and that in and of itself creates. Susan, how do you define partner other than owner? What is a partner who's not an owner? Yeah, um, someone who's part of the inner circle was how it was um, back in the day, but now that we have an executive committee, what does that actually mean? Um, it was clearer at that point in time, because when I became a partner, I became a partner and an owner, it was put forth to me that this is now, this is now a seat at the table. But it's not really like that anymore. Um, it's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just as your organization evolves and your partner team gets wider and wider, it becomes impossible to make decisions when you've got a bunch of people in the room. It was easier when it was There are no four. tables that big. Exactly. Right. Yeah, you, you, I mean, in, in our organization, I echo back to what Tim said, ownership, partnership, assuming they're the same thing, really is a, a financial investment. It, it's, and yes, of course, the owners are weighing in on certain things, but they're certainly not driving the executive committee. I mean, they may be approving you know, something or looking at the financials, making comments, but in my experience, and again, this is mine only, um, our executive committee is who operates the business and who delegates, you know, the CEO sits on it, but then the CEO takes whatever comes from the executive committee and delegates across the firm with others, of course. But the ownership group up here really isn't, you know, in the weeds, in the day-to-day, -day, directing anyone to do anything. And that's, that's my experience. Yeah, well, no, it's, this is the, the centerpiece of most of the consulting that I do with uh, smaller RIAs that haven't yet made this transition of uh, any significant transition of ownership <laughs> or uh, management responsibilities is I encourage them to separate these two concepts that we've been talking about. Ownership is one thing, management is another thing, and of course they'll overlap to some extent, but don't expect, it's not even a good idea, to have it be expected to be an identity, that the owners can be one, have for one purpose, as one group of people and the management has a different purpose and it may be a different group of people. Um, and then once you've separated out the concepts, then the light bulb comes on and says, oh, I get it. So, all right, then the next step is to trans begin the transition of equity, begin the transition of ownership, because that's, believe it or not, the easy thing to do. The word, the emotional baggage is, is on the control side of things. It's the management. But I don't want to give up control, so I don't want these other people to become owners of the firm, because then I'm going to have to have other voices at the table when I want to make decisions. So ownership doesn't confer any management responsibility unless you make it that way. So this decide up front that those are two different things, and then you can begin to transition the ownership, and that's the easy part. Once they've done that, oh, I get it. Then they can begin to contemplate how they transition the control function and deal with the emotional aspects of that. There's almost no emotion. I can tell you from lots of experience, there's almost no emotion about the money, believe it or not. Mainly, mainly because most CEOs of RIAs are already rich because they've been running very successful businesses, they've been receiving a lot of distributions of uh, their firm's profits, they're already rich. They really are not looking to maximize their personal wealth. Notice something else that you said. Um, you used the term inner circle. 
Um, and I think part of the issue in sort of a certain size of firm that's transitioning from, from being a relatively small firm where everybody knows everybody, kind of bar cheers, everybody knows your name, to an organization that's driven more by principles, structures, and methodology, and not so personal in its interactions. The term inner circle relates more to kind of a social group. It's a group, group of friends, it's a tribe, it's a, it's a team of some sort. It's, and those types of social structures tend to be more equal, more inclusive. Uh, they're not consumed so much by hierarchy, but it, it's kind of a high school term, if you forgive me for saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, partners are not meant to be the inner circle at all. Um, the notion there is much more about efficiency and execution of a vision, the pursuit of a vision where it's much more focused on how do we make decisions and how do we execute the decisions we made. It's a big mistake to treat your partnership group as the inner circle because that group is going to have trouble growing in size. You can't have an inner circle of 65, you can't have an inner circle of 20. At some point in time you have to separate the, the social interaction from the business decision making. And the business decision making needs to go in the hands of the people who are equipped with the information and the skills to make that decision, who have the authority to execute on that decision, and who have you know, valuable information to contribute. So the notion of a management committee is really bringing together the people who have the authority and the responsibility to make and execute decisions. It's as simple as that. And that's not an inner circle, it's not like you know, they, they serve the best sandwiches there, it's just the responsibility to make decisions there. The partnership group is meant to be broadly the people who are the best contributors of the farm. And then the best contributors have the right to elect some of the people that will drive the car. But decision making tends to favor more concentrated authority. Uh, the car with two wheels was the Batmobile that they used in the Christian Bale movie. I forget which one that was. But uh, for one reason or another, it was a very complicated car. It actually had two wheels and two drivers because it, literally every wheel was independent because it kind of has this wacky way of moving. Uh, apparently, the stunt drivers had the hardest time. You can, they have a museum of these Batman cars actually in the Universal Studios. That's how I know the story. Uh, I visited my kids, and apparently the stunt car drivers had the hardest of times ever driving this thing because there's two drivers that have to turn the wheel at the same time. It was a horrible thing to drive. By the way, some of your teams have called CEOs. That's a car with two wheels, and I know you have some thoughts on that, but that's kind of the idea. Decision making favors some concentration of authority. Things get executed, decisions make, get made faster. On the other hand, the social instinct is towards more inclusivity, people feeling more comfortable. When you mix the two, you can have some awkward stages. And it happens somewhere between half a billion to a billion. Firms kind of go through this transition of, hey, we used to be friends and get along, and you know that's what united us. And all of a sudden, we have all these structures, positions, committees that we sit on, and we're not as good friends as we used to be. Um, and it's hard. I mean, it's hard. I, I know my former partner and I, Stuart, we, we kind of jokingly said that first we were friends, then we were friends and partners, then we were partners, and now we're friends again, because uh, we sold the business. So sometimes the social interactions don't go hand in hand with the business interactions.